for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Professor Lisa Taylor. Uh, I teach uh, a couple of English classes here at Eastern, and it's um, really a privilege to be up here to introduce my friend, uh, Baron Wormser. Reading the work of Baron Wormser is like visiting a new town and seeing everything with new eyes that notice details like medicine bottles, hinges, hasps, and nails. Reading the work of Baron Wormser is like walking in the woods on an autumn day, taking in not just the shades of burgundy and gold, but the splintered twigs, pliant saplings, hollow hives, and a mountain biker fixing a flat at the edge of the river. It was a deliberate choosing that led him to the woods, and the shade, the coolness, the ever-changing play of the sifted light, audible mystery of trees. In his large body of work, there's a common thread, scrupulous attention to detail. He is at home in the world, whether walking in a forest, chopping wood, or driving to buy supplies. This ability to make art of ordinary moments gives dignity and meaning to seemingly routine tasks that all of us must complete each day. Barron begins his memoir with a poem called Building a House in the Woods, Maine, 1971 leaves and melting snow, and we started to hoop and jig for the vision of it, the earth strength we had lived too long without. Later he tells us, what brought me to the woods was the longing to be with words in an undistracted place. Baron and his family lived off the grid on 48 acres in rural Maine for nearly 25 years. His memoir of that time, The Road Washes Out in Spring, is a chronicle of challenges and unexpected bounty. In our increasingly connected, yet profoundly disconnected world, the writing of Baron Wormser reminds us of both our vulnerabilities and the small, yet necessary connections that will come to define each one of us. Please join me in welcoming my friend and mentor, Baron Wormser. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to, um, this will be a, a talk and a reading. Uh, I'm going to uh, read some from the memoir, which is an account of um, a year's off the grid uh, in Maine. My, my topic today is Thoreau's legacy, uh, that being, of course, Henry David Thoreau, the uh, author of Walden and uh, other classic books of our literature. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to begin with uh, reading some pages uh, about Thoreau. Um, what, um, what this is all about today, I mean, I've, my 13th book is coming out in December, so I've been a writer now for a while, but, but all my writing and is about, is about uh, how we live on Earth, basically, what our relationship is to the Earth, what we're doing here, basically, and how we, how we live our lives. And um, I think I think that's an important gist of um, of American literature. Um, this society is an experiment, and still very much is an experiment. And um, it's incumbent on each one of us actually to consider that crucial question of, um, you know, what are you going to do with your time here in terms of how you live your life. So this is this is about Thoreau. It is a measure of how aberrant the 1960s were, that so many took the words of Henry David Thoreau to heart. The words of Thoreau, of course, are meant to be taken to heart. He didn't write to be analyzed. He didn't write to please any fashion or lead any school. He was the purest sort of egotist, the one who holds each moment of his life in great esteem. A wry altruist, he wished that others might hold their lives in great esteem, not according to the dictates of attainment, but to the conscientious thrill of being alive. Thoreau, like his fellow American Walt Whitman, spent a goodly amount of time avoiding the justifications of an all-consuming job. The American enterprise of transmuting anxiety 
into the cult of work. The wearisome afflatus of Protestant justification as it sought and still seeks to find an ethic in time serving never attracted Thoreau. Walking around on the earth and noticing what was happening were plenty enough. Mere observation kept him employed. Curiosity delighted him. The initial incantatory sentence, however many times I read it, remains thrilling. And for those of you who have read it, you'll recognize this sentence. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. The woods? Why not foreign travel or political ambition or philandering? The woods? What did trees have to teach anyone? What did living simply, rudely, to any mildly polished soul have to teach anyone? The whole purpose of America was to rise in one station, not go live in a cabin and dine on dried apples and unleavened bread. Wasn't Thoreau foolish, immature, unimaginative, indifferent to sex, power, greed, money, and all that makes the world go madly round? Thoreau's character has never been the point. The point is the experience. Do you dare to take his dare? Do you dare to accept the sufficiency of the earth? Do you dare to live with the night and sunrise, the shade of trees at noon, the rain pelting like anger or soft as poppy petals, and the solitary quiet, above all the quiet, for the quiet cannot be borne by most people. It savors of emptiness and idleness. It makes people nervous. Nothing is happening. How are we to know that we are alive in the midst of silence? To verify our vitality, we need a tumult of some sort we need to proclaim the genius of our fidgeting. We need the reassurance of noise, even if it is only our voices avoiding the terrors of insight. In truth, the woods weren't utterly quiet. There were birds and winds and squirrels and sounds one might not have thought of before. Trees boomed in the shattering cold of January. Pond ice groaned as it stretched and contracted. Tree frogs gave recitals throughout the warm months. The earth was ever vital. It was the people who lived on the earth that were problematic as they mistook their individual purposes for life itself. Thoreau wished to reside with the wholeness of life on earth. The distractions of humankind were just that. Everything as it existed in any kind of weather fit comfortably in nature's back pocket. People were the ones who were forever squirming. But wasn't deliberateness tedious? How many fires did one have to start to learn what heat was? How many mornings did one have to rise with the sun? How many evenings did one have to lie in bed and do nothing but listen for the owls? Nature was all repetition, whereas humanity thrived on novelty. Wasn't novelty the spark of humankind? Even Thoreau liked to go on trips and see other rivers, lakes, and forests. The deliberateness that Thoreau sought was as variable as the weather. That was its pervasive joy. Great, almost unspeakable pleasure lies in frank attentiveness, the awareness that the ways of matter hold infinite treasures. 
Transience makes all those treasures all the more piquant. The churning human mind is the measure of nothing but its own excitement and lethargy. It never created a tree swallow or a March gale or a bed of pine needles. I say this not to produce paroxysms of abasement, but to speak to the enduring savor of being alive in the natural world. The question wasn't, one, wasn't what Thoreau was doing in that cabin. The question, apropos his famous night in jail, and Thoreau famously spent a night in jail because he refused to pay taxes to support a war, was what was everyone else doing by not living in that cabin? He knew the answer too well. Sometimes one feels he is taking out his bemused frustrations on those hardworking farmers of Concord, Massachusetts he loved to mock. How mulish and short-sighted they were, yet how well they slept at night, sure as they were of their labors and account books. Buddhism warns us against making things, of replacing what is with concepts of what is. Thoreau wished to feel what life was like when it was stripped down to satisfactions that needed no catalog or touting. Squishing a just-picked sun-warmed raspberry on one's tongue or jumping into a pond on an August afternoon needed no advertising or explication. The inclination is close to Buddhism's. We know at various moments how sweet a drink of water can be. There it is. What if we cherish that sweetness? What if that cherishing became a principle of our existence? What if our living were a meditation? Thoreau realized that he was turning his life into a totem of sorts. It amused him. Despite the seriousness of the man, a whimsy remains in him. He was alive to the humor of any human endeavor, and his own seriousness is ameliorated by that humor. This wasn't the often oppressive joking of Americans seeking to establish a degree of civility amid the welter of so many different people. It was the froth of free will. For a time, he chose to live at Walden deliberately, but he also chose to tramp most days around the environs of Concord and where he paused and where he turned were the markings of that free will. He followed his rather beak-like nose. His example was his own life. He required no others, but that example could translate into any life. I like to think of his steps on the earth, springy, zigzagging, steady, pensive, sturdy, halting. I like to think of him squatting and examining the corpse of a vole or shrew, listening to the rush of a snowmelt stream, watching clouds or feeling the wind on his bare arms, breathing in the mysterious night air, fingering the leaf mold beneath an old tree, or bracing himself in the quick morning cold. I like to think of him as sweating and shivering and lolling and even occasionally scratching himself. He stood for the opportunity the Republic presents almost in spite of itself, the chance to walk unhindered by the manacles of opinion and to feel what there is to feel in any natural moment. Perhaps given the flightiness of the human mind, such a disposition is unnatural, but often when I was outside our house and stood still on that bit of earth, I felt that the essential facts were not mysterious, yet more than I could ever comprehend. Life in the woods humbled and exhilarated me, for I began to feel how much there was to be alive to. I had Thoreau, in part, to thank for that. So that's some pages um, about Henry David Thoreau. And I think it speaks to some things that um, you know, have guided my life. And um, I mean, let's face it, okay, you know, Thoreau famously is, um, is known for, uh, for marching to a different drummer, 
Okay. And um, my wife and myself had been married over 40 years. Um, that's what's guided our lives. So, uh, so, so one thing, for instance, would be, as I was writing about, was about work, okay? If the idea in this society was after World War II, people were going to work less, okay? What a bad joke, right? People work much more than people previously worked, okay? The crucial line for me, I'm a poet, the crucial line for me in American poetry is from, of course, Walt Whitman's song of myself, I loaf and invite my soul. That's the crucial line of American poetry for me, okay? Not I work and invite my soul, but I loaf and invite my soul, okay? So what is that? That What that is, of course, is what? Basically, having the time to appreciate and be here, okay? Again, if I asked any one of you what's the crucial question for you as a human being, you know, and what, you know, what does it matter? What's the most precious thing to you about being a human being? And you know, you might say, you know, using your iPhone or whatever it is you're gonna tell me. But for me, the most crucial thing is living on Earth. That's it. That's the most crucial thing about being alive. And so for me and my wife and Thoreau and a lot of people in this country, all different kinds of people, um, that's what's driven, you know, the experience of of how I wanted to organize my life, how I wanted to live my life, what I wanted to be in touch with in this world. And what's remarkable about this society is almost in spite of itself, it still offers those opportunities to us, you know. If you want to go off and do it, you can still do it here, you know. And that's the quality I love about this place, honestly, this place being the United States, is if you want to kind of go off the map, you know, we always joke with people, we live in Vermont now, in northern Vermont, and we always joke with people, turn off your GPS, it doesn't work here, you know? Uh, because it, it doesn't, or people try to use it, they get really, really lost, they go over roads that are really not good roads to go over. And, and it's that off the map quality that I find really beautiful, because it's that, what, it's authenticity, it's originality, it's, it's your experience, not someone else's experience. Okay, um, and Thoreau is someone who, who did that. Typically, Thoreau, every day of his life, spent about two to three hours just walking around in the woods. That's what he did, you know, just in Concord, just being here. And he assembled this enormous sort of, like a scroll almost, of all the plants and the animals and the trees and the mushrooms and everything. And year by year, what he noticed, okay? Um, just just being here. I think, I think a big part of it, too, that's really hard for us to accept is our lives as human beings are linear, right? We have birthdays. We're all proceeding toward death. We count the years, right? Nature's not like that, right? Nature's cyclical, right? It's a totally different kind of timeline in nature. It's, it's all different, okay, right? The seasons just keep going around, right? That's a whole other way of being, okay? I mean, one, one simple way, actually, that I've experienced that is um, the house I live in now in Vermont is round, okay? A little bit like this room, okay? And a number of years ago, we had some people visit us who were, um, who were Apache Indians, and so they, that's their, their heritage. And um, when they walked into our house, they looked around and they looked at, you know, they looked, it's round, you know, they looked at a lot of windows to the south, it's a passive solar house. And they looked around and they looked at each other and then they looked around some more. And then they finally turned to my wife and myself and, and the, one of the, the oldest of them looked at us and said, okay, that's what he said. Um, because what? Because their whole world is based a lot more on what? on the circle, right, on the cycle, round, things just keep going around. Whereas our world is what? Corners, rectangles, squares, it's very, very different. Um, okay, um, I wanna leave time for questions so you could ask me like things about the outhouse and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna read now um, from a section 
again, when you live like this, it's, um, it's so much about what you take for granted, right? Um, you, and we take a lot for granted, given the world that we live in. When you live the way I live, you really just don't take any, uh, every, anything for granted. Water, okay, for instance, okay? We had a pitcher pump, okay? So every time I wanted water, I had to use that pump, okay? So it makes you think a lot about, about water, okay? Heat, we had no heat outside of wood heat. So anytime we wanted to be warm, we had to make that fire to be warm. Um, and light, okay, light's a real big one, okay? Um, our whole sense of light and, light and dark is, is really, really different because of, of this, right? And that's, you know, there's that, there's a movement, you know, in the United States for a lot of cities to turn off their lights at night, you know, because it confuses the birds. They're, they're not used to all this glow day and night, you know. And, you know, if you look at some of the cities, that glow is there all the time. So I'm going to read about light now, and, and you'll, you'll hear what our lives were like with light. Like most people who grew up in the United States after World War II, I thought of indoor light as a matter of flicking a switch. Electricity was current and currency. I had never seriously thought of life without it. Now and then the villages in Africa or Asia that I saw in photos in National Geographic reminded me that people were living without outlets and poles, but such worlds seemed inherently exotic and almost unearthly. There were no cars in those pictures, fast food containers, record albums, or refrigerators. Often someone with deep-set expressive eyes was staring into the photographer's expensive lens. So much feeling simmered in such a face that the practicalities of daily life, getting water, bathing, cooking food, being able to see when it got dark, vanished. Or what informed that face was the experience of deeper practicalities, ones I couldn't, as I sat in a dentist's fluorescent waiting room, fathom. I remember the evening of the first day in which we moved into our house in the woods. It started to get dark. And I thought, it is getting dark. That seems simple-minded. But what I felt was vividly complex. Night's coming was so profound, so transfixing, so soft yet indelible that I was startled and lulled in the same odd moment. I remember very clearly feeling how second by tiny second it was getting darker, how the dark was creeping in, how it was inexorable and delicate, how night fell a great slow curtain, how darkness grew, something organic yet rooted in the ineffable. Poets had written endlessly about the melancholy and charm of dusk. It was the time of haunting regret, another day never to be seen again. I could feel that mood as I moved about the house and watched the waning light. It was fluid, like ink in water, and calmly eerie. There was no switch to hit, to banish the dark, to create a clear divide, to join the bright ranks of the electrified world. We lit kerosene lamps. One hung from a beam in the kitchen area. Several were mounted on walls and a few sat on tables. The ones on the walls were small glass ones that were still commonly sold in main hardware stores. The lamp space sat in a metal holder that fit into a bracket. The one on our dining table was ceramic with pink flowers and light green leaves painted all around. The large one on our kitchen counter had a pedestal. It was glass ornate and semi-antique. When the inside of the house seemed too dark to move around in, we lit the lamps. It was an intuitive moment because over time, we got very used to darkness. 
The lamps lit only a relatively small area, so the house, which was one big room downstairs and a sleeping loft upstairs, held plenty of shadowy places. We moved in and out of the bright spaces that the little lights created. We felt darkness as an eminence, a deep totality, an extinction of the ever-glad sun. When we looked out the window, there was unrelieved night. The moon and stars were cold, clear, unearthly light. The attractiveness of the kerosene lamps, even the glass ones, were stamped on their sides with some scene in relief of sentimentalized rural life, a fancy horse-drawn carriage, for instance, or swirls of foliage belied their drawbacks. Coal oil has a strong, unlovely smell. We usually had a window partially open to air the house out. The wicks had to be trimmed regularly. The chimneys had to be cleaned when they got sooty. And of course, the lamps had to be replenished. That meant filling a five-gallon can at the local store and lugging it back to the small storage shed behind the house. That meant going out in all weather to fill the lamps. That meant an occasional spill and the crude, seemingly imperishable odor of kerosene on my hands or gloves. Light did not materialize of itself. Our efforts each day made it happen. A match had to be struck. Our heedlessness had a limit. We were aware that kerosene was the outcome of an industrial process. Our life in the woods was not in the service of a noble myth. Kerosene was available. We used it accordingly. A few guests over the years found the stench appalling and the light feeble. As much as they wanted to be charmed, they weren't. I love lying in bed and reading by the light of a small kerosene lamp. I was reading in the presence of an actual flame. I could feel that flame every second as it raggedly danced. Time was steady, but in the flame's movements, it varied. The feeling was as precious as the poems I read almost every night. The lamps were fussy, the wicks had to be adjusted to throw the most light without blackening the chimney. I took this attentiveness as one of the gifts that simple living provided. The lamps and the poems were really the same. They were a sweet labor. They formed shapes that were predictable yet unique. They were alive. When I looked at the house from the outside as I was coming back from the woodshed or outhouse, there was a soft glow inside it. Many a time that glow stopped me in my tracks. It was so beautiful. All around was forested darkness, but the house shone gently. It was a romantic glow. The romantic impulse is often disparaged. We fear the treachery of feeling. It's safer to dwell in the domains of irony. We cut short our losses because we cut short our longings. We parade our adjustment and disillusion as triumphs. We mock ourselves to forestall the world's mockery. The romantic impulse believes that there is an extraordinary amount of feeling available each moment. The trembling light is quietly breathtaking. It causes soot and stench. It came from the hard work of mining, processing, and trucking, and it's not particularly effective in lighting a large space. All true, but the feeling remains. Touch the glass chimney. It is hot with the heat that signals light. A poem, as it embodies emotion that is both modulated and fervent, possesses human heat and light. It speaks to an ache deep within us. If we take poetry down some pegs by insisting on its limitations, we diminish its force. We wind up the poor for our comfort. So, um, so the writing and the life um, very much went together. And uh, again, you know, if you ask me, say, 
What's the theme of a lot of the books you read in terms of 20th century writing? Okay, I would say the theme is Death in Life, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, Death in Life. And so for whatever reasons, that's always spooked me, that's always haunted me. Okay, the vision in the wasteland is of what? People crossing the bridges into London to go to work in the morning, okay? So we have that, whatever it is, the Long Island Expressway or whatever it is you wanna point to in our society, okay? And uh, always haunted me, always spooked me, okay? And I knew when I was your age already, I could never do it, couldn't do it, couldn't live like that. Had to find something else to do. And so the life in the woods was, you know, about, about coming to that place. And, but also, also the quiet, as I said, you know, again, I'm, I'm astonished, honestly, by our world and how ill at ease people are with quiet at this point in time in this world. And, you know, the world, I mean, a lot of times, nothing's going on, so to speak, you know? And I think, you know, the great, the great um, French thinker, philosopher, mathematician, Pascal, in the 17th century said, what is the hardest thing for a human being to do? The hardest thing for a human being to do is go in a room, sit down, and be still all by yourself and stay there for a while. That's the hardest thing for a human being to do. As far as I could tell, he was right, okay? As far as I could tell. Because we thrive on what? Distraction, right? At this point in time, distraction has become sort of the main course, right, of the society, right? It thrives on distraction. Whereas living in the woods was just totally opposite, totally opposite. Because, you know, again, it's like nothing's happening, you know? As I say, you may hear a tree frog, but a lot of the year, there's just nothing, nothing happening. Okay, um, how about questions? I could read more, but any questions about this, um, about this life in the woods or what, you know, any thoughts? Yep. Uh, so, about the people in the neighborhood. Right. Sure. Were there any students that were homeless? Um, well, you know, again, I had a day job. So, I mean, I lived in rural Maine. I lived in Somerset County, Maine. I worked in a school, and I don't know if there are any Mainers in the room, but uh, all right, where are you from? Okay. Um, I lived, uh, I worked in a school, a real rural school in Milltown, and um, it was a profoundly unromantic place, okay? It was a gritty, working class, poor, um, really a hard place, okay? Um, I mean, I could talk for a long time about things that I saw um, living in that world. And I write about them in this book, Violence, for instance, really intense violence, okay? Um, the little town I lived in, the little bucolic town I lived in, in rural Maine, in the years we lived in that town, okay? So we lived there over 20 years. I personally knew five people in this little town, 600 and some people, who were either murdered or suicide, okay? This is a little, little town in rural Maine. So, so the other side of it was profoundly unromantic, okay, in terms of just how people were living in lives, they're living their lives. Um, Appalachia, really, Appalachia goes from Arkansas up into Maine. Where we, li we lived in Maine was really pretty Appalachian. Um, but the romantic vision for me, yeah, it's still there, it's still there. I mean, if you're gonna be a poet in this society and do it for decades, you better be a romantic, you know? Um, because really no one knows what you're doing, you know what I mean, right? I mean, you can imagine I have a story um, because it's based on my life, you know, where, I mean, are you gonna tell someone that you're a poet, right? How do people respond to that? There are two responses that I've gotten all my life, okay? One response is, I don't get poetry. That's one response. People just say that right to your face, you know? because that's how they feel, right? They learn to hate it in school, they don't get it, and they never read it, so that's done. The other response is, I wrote a poem in the third grade, would you like to hear it? <laughs> that's the other response, okay. So, good to be a romantic. Yeah? Um, 
My name is Norma Vivar, and I just wanted to, I'm glad I got a chance to see you. We read The Road Washes Out in the Spring here as an Earth Semester book club book a couple of years ago. Um, so it's great to find to meet you after a couple of years. But cool. uh, one of the questions that came up when we read the book was, was there any particular impetus for you um, when you decided to we you were there in rural Maine for such a long time, raised children and the children went off to college. Was there any particular thing that that um, any particular impetus for you moving from there? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, my, one of my answers to that is always read the last chapter of the book, you know, because I go into that some in the last chapter, but only some, and I think. I think, I think there are a couple of things. I think one thing, again, and this is mostly a room of younger people, that one reason we did what we did too is we were really seeking older people who could be our mentors, who could really teach us how to live like that. And the older people knew that. They knew how to live like that. And for us, they were our teachers. They were really the wise people that we wanted to meet um, in this world. And they died off, you know, um, one way or another. You know, I write about a dairy farmer who committed suicide because his farm went under. He was one of our teachers, oh, the guy who built our house, our neighbors. We had a lot of teachers. Um, they died off. It wasn't the same being in that world without them. We really, really, really missed them. Um, so that, that, was, that was a big, big part of it what was that. You know, the other thing was that our kids grew up, and the house was very associated with our children growing up in that house, and so it just came to feel like, okay, we have we've done this, we've done this stage of our lives basically, because what I write about, I can't read the last chapter of the book aloud to a group of people like this, because usually because I start crying, it, because it just uh, this all runs so deep. Um, I was interviewed for television from Boston that came up to the house and they you know did a little segment about the book in the house and same thing happened I, I just started crying and uh, but the the good news so to speak is that it, it's in me it's in here I mean this till the day I leave the earth this experience will never go away and so I have that in me so wherever I am that you know that's that's there that's the short answer to <laughs> to a very <laughs> To a very big question, yeah, yeah. Any other questions from you folks um, about this? Um, yeah. Um, do you still find yourself practicing like the deliberate living even though you're not there? And how do you tap into that if you're not in that place? Yeah. Well, we're all on the earth every day, so I mean, you know, it just depends where you are. I mean, I still live in a rural place, live on a dirt road, you know, uh, 27 acres, you know. So, I mean, you know, it's not hard. Um, my wife and I have always been intense gardeners, so, you know, that's part of it, you know. Still heat with wood heat, so I'm still involved in that whole world of making fires. Made one this morning. Um, so, yeah, so that, that connection is, is still there. I have to have that, that kind of connection for me as a human being, but you know, it just varies. I mean, I have a friend, a good poet friend who you know, lives on West 70th Street in Manhattan. You know, she grows basil on her fire escape, you know, and that's, that's it for her. You know, that's, everybody's different in terms of how, how they connect. She walks in Central Park every day, you know, so it's different for all of us, but, uh, but for me, you know, I, I sort of need that rural fix, you know. Any other, any other, yeah. Is there any real turning point for you when you realize you're gonna live your life this way? Um, I don't think, I think, again, who I am a lot is, is generational, and it's kind of fascinating, actually, because I'm part of that, what's loosely called the, you know, the back to the lad generation, you know. You see all those people frolicking in the mud in Woodstock, you mm -hmm. know. A lot of those people just stayed frolicking in the mud, so to speak, you know? I mean, when, this book is literally called The Road Washes Out in Spring because that's the road I lived on. 
I know what it is to bury a Jeep above, almost above the top of the tire. You know, I'm talking real mud, you know. So, so it's generational, you know, in part. You know, a lot of people just want to, like, get the hell away from cities, basically, and, and, and reconnect, reconnect. The thing that's interesting to me, because I live now in rural Vermont, is, like, it's a wheel that's come around again, you know. I mean, well, you know that, or some of you must know that. Like, the number of um, younger people who are moving in to where I live in Vermont is, is kind of astonishing to me. You know, because there was a big lull in there. It was the yuppie generation that's in between. Um, that word didn't exist, and then there it was in the 80s, yuppies, you know, a whole other kind of uh, person. But where I live now, it's very intense in terms of that, you know, just that awareness of the earth, farming, and all the things that go with that, including some really wonderful things like making beer. Wow. So, uh, so yeah. Good things, good things. Any other, um, any other, no one's gonna follow up and ask me the beer question, okay. So, uh, okay, um, I'm gonna read now a little bit um, about one of, the, one of the people with whom we connected in the woods, because it's so much about the people that we live with who are rural people, Mainers, old Mainers, um, and you know, just, who were these people? Because we didn't know. I mean, I grew up in a big city. I grew up in Baltimore. And um, I want to read you some about one of these people. Um, so this is about our building this house. We built this little cottage in the woods. Very simple. We resolved to build our house ourselves. Though my wife had studied architecture for a time and was a capable designer, the world of practical carpentry was a mystery to us. We knew what a two by four was and what a hammer was, but we didn't own a skill saw, much less a table saw. Perhaps we would do the whole thing with a hand saw and an ax. What did we know? We had read a do-it-yourself book or two that showed how houses were built. We would follow the instructions just as we did when we encountered a new recipe. As college graduates, we could learn whatever we had to learn. It's hard for me to fathom how simple-minded yet determined we were. I look back at us at the beginning of our sojourn in the woods as somewhat holy fools. Serendipity will provide. It did. Illumination, to say nothing of practical help, appeared in the form of a main carpenter and jack of most trades named Caleb. Word must have gotten out in the neighborhood that some hippies were building a house or camp or cabin or something utterly unspeakable in the woods. Caleb was curious enough to brave the morass of our road. He got out of his battered mid-1950s pickup and sauntered up to our site, a man in his early 60s with a limp, a pot belly, a ruddy complexion, and very steady blue eyes. We, which meant myself, my wife Janet, and her younger brother Dave, were pondering the mysteries of concrete not actually pouring any, but pondering it. We had the old dug well from which to draw water. We had a wheelbarrow to mix the stuff, and we had a lot of empty tubes to fill on which the house would reside. Due to heavy rains, the holes in which those tubes sat were mostly full of water. Small frogs were hopping about everywhere with what seemed like great abandon. Caleb's main accent had a musical twang. His voice moved slightly up and down as he spoke his introductions, though his tone was steadily bemused. We chatted about the weather. We all agreed it had been rainy, and how it seemed as though more and more young people were moving to Maine. Then, very politely, Caleb looked the scene over and asked us in a mild, wry voice, if we had ever built a house,
house before. Well, not really, we replied. We didn't even bother with some qualifying but. How, he asked after a brief respectful pause in which he tugged at the visor of his green cap, would you like me to build this for you? Take a couple of weeks, a jiffy. He halted. You can help. My wife and I deliberated for a few seconds before nodding wholeheartedly. Caleb smiled a false tooth smile. We'll get her up before you know it, you just see. We talked over a few details about mixing concrete and what we had for lumber. Caleb shook our hands. He was missing the tips of two fingers on his right hand. Then he headed back to his truck. We never talked money. The next day we started very early, around six. Caleb favored the cool hours of the morning. He'd get up in the dark of 4 or 5 a.m., eat a bowl of oatmeal, then head off to work. He was still very strong. When he worked, it was with a kind of relentless determination. I'd never until that day seen anyone work the way Caleb worked. He kept moving constantly. While directing Dave and me, we were manning the wheelbarrows and two of his relatives, a grandson and grandson-in-law, who knew how to carpenter. He didn't pause. He didn't look around. He, I don't even recall him excusing himself to take a leak behind a tree. I was surprised he didn't finish the whole job in a day. As it was, we poured all the concrete and started cutting the sills that day. If he hadn't been so good-natured, I would have thought he was possessed. Dave and I collapsed with fatigue as soon as he left. The main that we wanted to be close to was personified in Caleb. He had finished school after seventh grade, had enough of sitting at a desk, and had gone to work in the woods. He had worked in lumber camps and carpentered his whole life. Though various construction companies had employed him, he preferred being his own boss. He loved to build rough structures, barns, chicken houses, outbuildings. Finished carpentry held no allure for him. His favorite phrase was, close enough, spike it. An eighth of an inch didn't keep him awake at night. Though he used a spirit level, he didn't let it deter him. So this goes on about, about Caleb, who was, uh, who was one, of our, one of our mentors and, and very much the world of Old Main um, that we wanted to, to connect with. Um, he was a fascinating guy. He had um, six daughters. All other names began with D, Dixie, Darlene, Delphine, Dora, I can't remember the other two. Um, and he was, he was a clean liver. I mean, again, because so many of the people around me were alcoholics one way or another. Never, never touched a drop. Um, his wife was a um, Seventh-day Adventist. Um, Caleb never went into a church. Um, despised religion, had no use for it whatsoever, thought it was just the province of women was their problem. And he was, he was devoted to this world of work. That's, that's the world he knew. And again, I didn't know what work was until I met this guy, really. I mean, people in this society say, you know, they work. They don't work. They don't work. I mean, you know, when I see people work, maybe three hours out of eight, you know, they're working. I mean, if you're doing physical work, this guy worked eight hours and he was going every second of those eight, and he thrived on it. He loved it. That was the world that he grew up in, the world that he knew. One of the stories I tell in here is in the Depression, he was in a lumber camp in a town in northern Maine. He had 25 cents to his name. He took the quarter and threw it away, and that's so much who he was. He was fearless human being. He, he knew he could take care of himself, and I guess that's what we wanted to learn a lot, how to take care of ourselves. Okay, I've got a little bit of time. Any more questions? Any more questions? Any more questions? Um, 
chimneys, a fireplace, nice fireplace, um, and the land. So we had about 50 acres of land. The whole thing cost $13,000. It's labor and materials and land, okay? So uh, something seems to have changed since the, the mid-1970s in the United States. Somehow people's income and prices have not exactly stayed in, the, stayed in connection there. So yeah, that's what it cost. Do you know the house is still there? It's still there. It's for sale now, actually. We were driving through uh, a week or a month or two ago. And uh, first, when we sold it, we sold it to some uh, people from, and we couldn't even get a realtor to carry the house. It was such a bizarre enterprise, you know, for most people. And uh, so we sold it to some out of staters who wanted to use it as a hunting camp. They pretty much trashed it. Um, and then they got divorced, so they cut over all the land. But then it got sold to a guy who was a minister. And he, he brought it back and used it as a kind of spiritual retreat kind of place. Um, so we were just there, and we were just actually, you know, the fruit trees are still there. We picked a couple pears, you know, when we were there. Um, yeah, it's still there. Our neighbors, whom I write about, their house is gone, their barn's gone. I mean, that's that strange quality in northern New England. It, keep, it's, it, it keeps reverting back to the woods, you know? And uh, where, I, where I live, Somerset County, it's like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's for sale. Doesn't cost much, actually. Any more? Any more? Any more? Okay, it's great to be with you this afternoon. Thanks for coming out. There's uh, a book table over there. If anybody would like to purchase any of Barron's books, I'm sure he'll stick around to sign them for you. So thanks again for coming.